excited. Sounds good. All right. In a Toast of Life podcast, the most authentic and most organic podcast out here, Let's baby. See. Let's go. We're here on a very amazing Sunday after a long night with my guy, Dylan. Really Sunday? I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, 20, <laughs> I'm 23. I can, I can still hold he up. He can recover a lot faster than us. But I'm so excited to introduce the guy to my left, man, the highly anticipated, very motivating, hardworking trainer, entrepreneur, athlete, Mr. Jimmy House in the Let's house, go. baby. Let's go. Let's go. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's exciting. Nah, man. I appreciate you coming all this way hey. from Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Glendale, Arizona. He was very excited. Was like, <laughs> dude, he was like a little kid. He was jumping around. He's like, dude, dude, I got it. I was like, dude, no way. Well, yeah. Now, I, I've been seeing the clips, like, well, obviously following Chris and everything. And yeah. so I always thought that your guys' podcast production-wise and content was, I mean, obviously, the numbers speak for itself. Thank you. But amongst, like, the best I've seen, I'm like, oh, that'd be really, really cool to get on there. But obviously with the... With the distance between us, it's hard, but I'm glad we yeah. can make it work. I'm, I'm glad I, I tagged you in a post and you saw my my shot that I took a couple <laughs> months ago. <laughs> I think that was right before we left to San Diego for Chris, the first time we ever met him. So I think I'm it was bad, like I'm bad with June, August? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. And he was like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's all right, bro. <laughs> I know. Things happen for a reason, <laughs> no, right? No, that's my bad. Yeah, I can't believe I missed it. I, this whole time, I thought Chris was honestly like a part of the – the crew, because, you know, he <laughs> has so many clips with you guys. But, yeah, no, that's awesome. Nah, man, Chris shows mad love. And just like I think right now, we are sitting down at the most perfect moment in all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Right now, you are traveling everywhere. You're doing collabs with a lot of people. You're giving knowledge to the, to the world that's watching you. Thank you. Social media is growing. Yeah. Like, I think the, earlier this week, you were like at 50-something. Yeah, last week it was like 50-something. It's growing. This, this year alone, through all the traveling and, and organic, like, double in growth. So it's good. You don't you don't need to get those uh, weird DMs. Let me grow your IG organically anymore? Oh, no. I, I pay every single one of those that's come through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so look at the likes, guys. You, you know what we're talking about. But this is about you, man. So for the, the people tuning in, I do want to give a shout-out to Adam, the owner of this gym right now, that lends yes, us to us the space, Hidden Strength, in our window. Yeah, beautiful, right? beautiful facility. Jimmy's about to kill us with the workout after this because <laughs> I'm going to go eat. Dylan's going to go eat. I'm going to go eat. I'm going to go eat. But let's, let's start from the beginning, man. Where where did you grow up? Siblings, all that good stuff. Yeah, so I'm from Glendale, Arizona, which is like basically like a suburb of Phoenix. Most people know about Phoenix. So I grew up mostly an only child. I do have a half-sister, but her and I kind of grew up separated for most of our lives. We recently just got reconnected, which is great. But the majority of my life, I grew up an only child. And, you know, through the various trials and tribulations of going through a childhood and, and learning how to lift at a young age and then, you know, having to learn how to get personable with other people, I found that I have an extrovert, extroverted personality at times, but for the most part, I'm introverted. I get that from my dad. And being an only child and having limited time around others, that's a skill that I've ever had to work on, even up until now at this point. Like, even going into podcasts that I've done hundreds of at this point, it's still a little <laughs> bit like, all right, we need to, like, switch gears here. But, you know, for the most part, I grew up an only child. I started lifting at a young age, been doing sports all my life. And then for now, I don't know, I started training, actually, my best friend right there when I was 15, and that bled into the coaching and training that I'm doing now. Obviously, that bled in jiu-jitsu. I know I'm kind of speeding through my life here, but that's like the gist of, of the beginning of everything, yeah. All right, so we, you sped it. That's the podcast. You sped yeah, it, so it there you off. go. <laughs> there you go. Well, we got his whole life in 60 seconds. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that's an IG reel. There, oh, it is. Yeah, there it is. That's an IG reel. We just need that's one. It. That's it. You know, <laughs> we, we need one to follow. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so taking it slowly back, only mm -hmm. child. You said you weren't around a lot of people, but you're – Found out you're extroverted, but for the most part, introverted. So in high school, I think for everybody from high school, who was Jimmy then? Were you the athletic, outgoing, outspoken type of Jimmy? Or were you just to yourself about your business and sports? And, and what sport did you play? Yeah, so I rest, Well, so I started with football, but then I ended up wrestling my four years. I ended up quitting football to pursue wrestling. To answer your question, I find that my extroverted side comes out like when I'm around my passions mm. and when I'm in a teaching role and I get to essentially let my voice be heard and 
articulate myself through the knowledge I've gained, through the experiences I've gained in life. Yeah. But for the most part, I'm relatively introverted when it comes to either being around new crowds or being in situations that I don't feel maybe justified is a bad word, but justified to speak in. I mostly just stay quiet until spoken to for the most part. But again, if I'm in a teaching role, which a lot of times I am now doing like jujitsu teaching full time or, you know, whether it's doing podcasts or doing some type of instructional video online for working out, that's usually when I let my voice be heard without much uh, remorse at all. So it's, it's one of those things where I remember doing interviews in high school for like either the school's newspaper or like the school kind of like sports video yeah. page. And I look at some of those videos, and it's relatively cringy for the most part. Um, like, for example, if I were to apply or send in a resume to get in on this podcast, I probably wouldn't send those first few outside of my hair and the clothes I wore during that time. It's just, like, oh, all together, not, not, not the best, not the best look. But it's come a long way since then, and, and I found that, like, as long as I'm around my passions or around people that I can share passions with, then I'm relatively good at talking, and I generally like to talk more than probably what you guys expect. So <laughs> we, we yeah. know we just know we notice right now. Like, uh, I've taken the reins, man. Either, either he wants to get through it quick, or he wants to freaking yeah. train or get to already. lifting He's already. Like, I just want to go go train already. <laughs> so, but what's what does it take to be like that? Because even when you transfer into your passion, I still feel like there is a sort of a barrier you could call it mm -hmm. that, like, man, maybe I'm not good. Like self doubt. I think right. the perfect word is self doubt. Like right now, before we before we started this, I had to take a buzz ball. Mm -hmm. hey, sometimes I still get nervous, man. Uh -huh. I I'm so scared for me fucking up. Right, I hear you. Like um, I know I'm gonna do good. How you said it. when it's in my passion, when it's in my element, I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. I can do this. But they're still like, damn. What if? What if I'm not that good? Mm -hmm. I think to the to your point, that's that's just experience, and then gaining confidence through the experience. You know, you guys. Came in here, you got your setup ready, you had all these different things go, you know, where red cord, blue cord goes pretty good. So at yeah. the end of the day, you know that your experience kind of carries you through and then the confidence kind of is just a byproduct of that. For me, at one point, I knew a decent amount about lifting, more than most people, but like because I didn't have the experience in articulating myself through the different either coaching cues or, or what have you, that, that kind of showed in my presence on camera or just in a in a public setting environment teaching others. And so what I found was the more I did it, the more that I had knowledge to back up the words that I was saying, mm. then there's like confidence that comes with that because I think lack of confidence comes from almost the unknown, either the unknown of what other people think about you or the unknown of what you're trying to uh, teach. So with that said, as soon as I really, really put my effort in and educating myself and gaining the experience through trial and error, that's when I started to feel like unrestricted and my my speaking essentially like my be, my ability to articulate what I want to say to others. Damn. So, speeding up right after high school, did did you win state? Did you titles? What's up? Yeah. So, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> come on. Was this the part where you wanted me to cry? Or <laughs> no, nah, not yet. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you later. It'll come, come later. later. It'll come right, yet. Well. well. <laughs> uh, so that's an interesting story. I mean, to me, it is. To most people, not really. But basically, I started wrestling my freshman year. And I was kind of going through a transition where football, I quickly found out, wasn't it for me mm -hmm. in regards to I spent the majority of my childhood playing football. It was my very first passion, bar none. And I had a lot of expectations for myself and how high school would go. I got into high school, and with the coaches I was around and some of the players I was around, I quickly had a reality check of what my reality was. And I just very quickly saw that I wasn't going to fit in that mold, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe at other high school, it would have been better. But again, everything happens for, the, for a reason, and timing's always perfect. So then, after wrestling in middle school, I went into high school, and I was, like, contemplating starting wrestling because it's the hardest sport in the world, and the workouts are terrible, and, like, I already thought it sucked enough in middle school. <laughs> I didn't even want to think about what high school was going to be like. Yeah. But then after such a terrible football experience my freshman year, it's like, okay, well, I'm either going to force myself to be around these people that I really don't enjoy being around, just because I feel like I have to play football, or I could go the wrestling route. I'm very, very scared to go the wrestling route, but I could go the wrestling route, test it out, and maybe I'll end up liking it. So I remember going into my dad's room the night before the wrestling season started, asking his opinion, and he just said, like, hey, like, you know, just try it, and, and you know, if you don't like it, then you don't have to do it, but just give it a shot. I was like, okay, that was kind of the confidence I needed to take that first step, and after finishing my freshman year on varsity and finish, finishing my freshman year, the top 
freshman on varsity at my weight, I saw some of the stats and I was like, okay, maybe if I pursue this, I could actually end up being a state champion because the record I had did put me number one for freshman in the state of Arizona uh, on varsity that year. So then that doesn't mean, that's not a guarantee, but what it does mean is like, okay, I'm in the vicinity of where I need to be. Yeah, but that also puts a target on your back now. Now everybody knows, like even right now when you go into playoffs Mm -hmm. in high school, you see a team, you see a name on the top 10 or top 15, whatever right. it is, and it's like, I want him. Yeah, that's the guy. Sure. That's the guy everybody wants, right? Yeah, definitely. So with that said, you kind of carried that responsibility through your sophomore, junior, senior year, and I was able to overcome a lot of that, get to the point where after my junior year, I was coming into my senior year, actually ranked number one at 182 pounds for the state of Arizona. Yeah. So I kind of like – match that protocol that I had had foreseen for myself but then with that said I carried myself almost 40 no my first 40 matches my senior year and I was going into state between number one and number two between myself and the returning state champ and the week before state I actually got a really bad concussion six days before state went to the ER the athletic director was informed, and I was done within a matter of seconds. So, yeah, from my freshman year, kind of making that goal for myself and then literally being six, six days out from that goal, having it cut, that was a, one of my first, I think, major adversities I really had to overcome for myself because it was the yeah. first time where I really, like, set myself to something where, you know, as a kid, my dad encouraged me to play football, and that's something I kind of fell into. But wrestling was the first thing that I really decided to do for myself yeah. and put in the effort for myself. And then having that essentially rug pulled out from underneath me. I was me, about to say that, yeah. That was the first time that I really had to overcome something that was hard, I think, in my life for the most part. And then I had things happen after that. But that was the first one where I, could, I chose to either, like, let it crumble me or chose to let it motivate me into something else. And that ended up being powerlifting and then jujitsu. And then, you know, fast forward to where I'm at now. Yeah. So if I, I do want cause how he said, I was so excited to sit down here with you because I've been a fan of you for the last like two, three years, bro. Like, <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, damn, this guy lives fucking X amount of weight is always excited and ecstatic of the weight he's pulling and the circle he brings around him. Right. Um, the type of persona that goes into that, I feel like in order for us to be this excited, this motivated, this energetic, and this passionate, Mm -hmm. it's because we went through something internally that maybe not a lot of people know that it builds us all up for Mm -hmm. that moment. So when you deadlifted, right, and one of the moments, I I could bring it up now, um, was at C.T. Fletcher's um, open gym, right? Right, yep. Uh, Iron Wars. Mm -hmm. And you were battling an injury, yeah. And yeah. you literally got up there and you still said, I have all these injuries, but because of CT. So it's like, why battle through pain? If you know your body can't take it no more or if your body is hurting, you're hurting. Mm-hmm. Why go through the pain and how do you get out of that, that hole that you're in? I think it's, it's a skill to be able to determine the, the line between actually physically being unable to do something and then mentally telling yourself you can't. And so, like, that's vague, but what does that mean? Well, to me, what you first start off with what can you do? So when it comes to injury, like, when I first fully tore my PCL, partially tore my ACL, three almost full tears in my MCL and then fractured my femur, I'm limited at the beginning, right? The, fuck? <laughs> the whole alphabet. Oh, yeah. I was like, God, yeah, yeah. Damn. dude, the whole leg is cut off by this <laughs> yeah. point. What yeah. the hell? Basically, the only things that were saved was like my LCL meniscus. But yeah, it was a pretty gnarly injury. So you start off, and it's like, okay, this is like relatively not the best. But what can I do? And that yeah. starts with like walking backwards, and you do the sled backwards. By the time I got to CT's event, I believe I was five weeks out from that, five or six. And I started deadlifting again in preparation to do that. And it's like, it, then it becomes like, what can I do? So I might not be able to deadlift my normal 700 pounds, but my knee's holding up for X amount of weight. And I definitely can carry through, be a man of my word, because I gave CT my word. Like, I will be there at your event, CT, you know what I mean? So, Dang. you know, whether I could participate in the deadlifting or not, I was going to be there. But then when I saw like, okay, maybe I can do a little bit more than what my either doctor or what the negative side of my mentality tells me to, then I was like, okay, I think I can pull a little bit. And then ended up being a little bit more than what I thought. And, you know, CT, for anyone that doesn't know his story, like he's 
He's died a couple times. Uh, you know, he's had heart yep. transplants. Like, currently right now, he deals with, like, extreme, like, pain and, and his joints and his feet from all the medical implica- uh, implications he's had. It's like, who am I to come in there and be like, oh, my knee hurts, but I can't deadlift for you, CT. It's like, he's done so much for me in my life, getting me connected with my childhood hero, Big Bill Goldberg, and just supported me and my friends and my dreams and my vision. He's gone out of his way so much for me in the past. Like, he's gone to my jiu events here in California. Uh, he's taken time out of his day to just give me, like, mentorship talks. It's like, who am I to go in there and be like, yeah, CT, I'm going to have to call it, call it a day for you. And like, I'm going to give my best in that current state, and at that time, it was getting 550 up and so you know looking back I didn't hurt myself but I did push myself to a point that I in weeks prior definitely did not think I could do do you feel like at that one point you owed it to him to be the best you that you could be at that exact moment yeah there's a lot of things like that that go through my head I think I owe it to him I think I owe it to my friends and my supporters my family and I think I owe it to myself to be able to maintain and carry the the standard that I that I preach to people that they should imply for themselves, but also at the same time, the standard that I try to hold for myself, it's like, I could look at a day like that and I could be like, you know, the safe bet is just to not do it and just deadlift when I'm 100% again. But then you're only going to get so many opportunities like that in your life. And I've been blessed to have like countless, especially with CT. And, you know, life is too short and CT will only be around for so long. And so it's like, am I really going to miss an opportunity like that to, to, give him a, an expression of my gratitude in, in one of the most, in my opinion, pure or transparent ways possible, at least with yeah. him. It's like, I could tell him thank you, CT, for everything, but what yeah. a better way to tell CT thank you than Shame to it. lift heavy-ass weight, than to fight through injury, yeah. than to do it at his home gym in front of all his friends and supporters and just shed light again on the inspiration that he's been for millions of people. Yeah, because for the people that tuning in now, if you don't know, like, Back then when Big Rob, Mike Rashid, mm. and CT, you know, the Valley of the Beast, you know, overtraining. Yeah, yeah. Like, no matter what you thought, overtraining was the way to go. And how you said, he died, he came back, and he's still out there giving all that energy. And I think that's the perfect way to give back to the people that show you love and support. Is just because I could tell you I love you and thank you doesn't mean I really mean it. Mm-hmm. It's about the actions. Yeah. I'm going to show you I love you and I thank you. And the way I'm going to show you is by showing up. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna, like, I don't, you got to go watch that video <laughs> to see that, to see the expression of CT, your expression, the energy around that, that everybody is just like, that's Jimmy. Thank you. That's Jimmy. Thank you. So I think that's one of those things that I'm so grateful for here because because of where this is at now, our, our journey, me and Dylan's in this podcast, we get to reach people bigger than us and people that we've always admired. Chris is one of them. Mm-hmm. Gino, yourself, yeah. and everybody else that's coming to tune. Like, now everybody's going to watch you. Thank you. Listening to you. They want to know, why do you lift so heavy? Why don't you stay in one area? Yeah. Why do you do so much? Why do you train? Why do you coach? Why do you still power lift through the injuries? Because it's not the first time you injure yourself. Mm -hmm. You keep going. So why keep going and why go through the pain even though you've had everything to to basically quit? Mm -hmm. I think, well, the reality of it is, as much as there's positive gain out of it, the the, the negative part is is that I think there's a reliance on my ability to express myself through training or how much weight I lift or or my jujitsu ability or whatever. So even when I get injured, it's like there's there's a huge like hole per se that I need to fulfill. And maybe that's like something I should address later on in life, you know, but not right now. <laughs> With that said, uh, the positive side of it is I understand that I've been, I'm in a place now to where I'm impacting a lot of people. And I'm very mm-hmm. grateful for that. My goal is to forever grow upon that outreach. And so if I'm able to do what inspires people to any capacity, to me, again, it's, it's a standard that you set for yourself. It's understanding my purpose on earth. It's, it's a very, very deep, like, rabbit hole to go down. But if I can perform to any capacity within the, the different blessings that I've been given through God and, and the different things that I've worked for my whole life, it's like, again, I owe it to myself, my friends, my supporters, and, and those that can be inspired by it to do what I can. And, and to your point, like earlier, it's like, Doing what you can, for one, is probably more than what you think you can do, but for two, is more than enough to show people that, like, anything is possible, and then 
through injury, through adversity, or through whatever comes up in life, you can always find a way to get it done as long as your mind is innovated enough to, to find the way. And that's what, that's what I try to do, especially through this injury process. Is like I know I like jujitsu, I like lifting, I like doing these different things, but I can't physically do them to my 100% capability right now, but it doesn't mean I have to stop. And practicing that mindset then builds like this sheet of armor that then prepares me for whatever worst trials and tribulations come on later in life. And that's kind of how I view it. It's like this whole injury process has been nothing but a chance to practice what I preach, a chance to add another sheet of armor to protect myself in the future. And just to, again, like open my mind and, and, you know, add another wrinkle to my brain in regards to what I can do and what I can do to help other people. Damn. He leaves me speechless. <laughs> I know. I'm just admiring him. <laughs> I know. Looking at him is just like, yeah, I feel yeah, that, yeah. bro. <laughs> also, <laughs> nice to meet you, bro. Thank you for having us. I appreciate no. it. That's uh, that's not Adam. I know. Oh, that, Adam. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. But that's my guy, Andrew, owner that's of Pure sponsor, Gains. Yeah. You know, he's one well, of our sponsors, too. Nice to meet you, bro. Love that guy. Thank you, man. Thank you for waking up today. <laughs> yes. I, I struggled to waking Dylan up. but Wait, no, I, was, I was awake like at 6.30. This wasn't even awake yet. I had a light of him. I was like, I'm going to be there at 8, 7 o'clock. My, my girlfriend woke me up today. It's fine. <laughs> I said my girlfriend woke me up today. It's fine. <laughs> you a heavy sleeper? Uh, on my lazy days, yeah. So, like, all eight of them. Like. All right. So, for, for everybody wondering, I know I'm wondering, you train hard, you lift heavy, you coach. How many hours of sleep do you get? <laughs> uh, yeah. That so makes, That makes three of us. All right. Know, yeah. us. We're all in the same boat. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think it probably averages out anywhere from five to seven. But that's where, like, I, I could uh, be better in life because, like, I get I probably get a decent amount of sleep, but because I, like, ride it out to the very last second to where I'm, like, I'm showing up, like, right on time or a few few minutes late to certain things or, you know, like, we're supposed to leave at 530, we leave at 6, and, like, things like that. Maybe that's where I need to be better. But in general... I try to get as much sleep as I can. And sometimes during the day, like the busier days, like I find that just literally closing my eyes in a dark room for like 20, 25 minutes and then starting the second half of my day honestly helps me a lot. Um, so that's, that's something that I've been applied more recently where my schedule has been bi busier than ever. Yeah. Driving from place to place, meeting person to person and, you know, almost simulating the, the environment of getting an extra nap has helped me a lot, like, carry through the day. I think there's, like, a reliance sometimes when it comes to, like, rest and stuff. Rest is, is essential, but sometimes when we feel like we need more sleep, at least for me, if I can, like, almost simulate the environment that I'm, like, needing in order to get more rest. That's enough. Yeah, it, it, like, mentally it's enough, and then yeah. I'll feel like shit at the end of the day, but at least we got through, so, yeah. <laughs> so, for, for those people that, like, always, and this is... Uh, just in the work aspect, the ones that count sleep more important as to work even harder. So if your day is busy and you're trying to be an entrepreneur, which you are, but I need more sleep. I'm too tired. Like, what, what's the aspect on that? Because I feel like there's the, the generation that we're in right now, people value more sleep than working hard. Right. Okay. So then, so then any amount of success in life requires sacrifice. And sacrifice could be sacrifice of friends, relationships, sleep, food, whatever. With that said, most people think they need more sleep and then they get more sleep. So they sacrifice time and in investing in their business or their training or their, their quality of life out, outside of that. And so I, there probably is a decent balance between both, but then obviously the sacrifice has to be put in place in other aspects of life. Then you ask yourself like is sacrifice with my friends or with my social hour or whatever the case may be, is that worth it? So I think like, let's take somebody that's like a hundred percent driven athlete. Like being an athlete is your job. That's your passion. That's all you want to do in life. The sleep is, is the, one of the most important things that you can do outside of training. In fact, like just as important, if not more. So then at that point you have to then sacrifice other aspects of life. Mm. So I think there's merit to people saying that they need more sleep because I think we all do at the end of the day. But if you sacrifice getting more sleep and then you miss out on the work that needs to be done when you're awake, there's probably aspects of your life that you could dial down even more on that allow for more sleep while still maintaining your quality of training or whatever else you need to do to advance yourself. It's just, again, whether or not you're willing to make that sacrifice. And if you are, then what I suggest is just write every single hour of your day down for the most part and you can probably, like, 
pick out a one to two hour time window when you could either either fit in a nap or go to bed earlier or wake up earlier. It's just a matter of if you are willing to do that or not. Yeah, I think that's like that's like a big uh that's a like people when we when we give the time to people to talk to them, right? And we I think we all know when to give those people that time. Mm -hmm. They're like, damn, you guys don't fucking sleep. How do you guys do it? I'm like, bro, we're driven. Like we're so motivated. Mm -hmm. Like if we get three hours, four hours of sleep and it requires us to be up the next morning at this time, we're not gonna Mm -hmm. miss. We can't miss. Right, totally. Right? Because I think from just from our parents, Hispanic parents. Hey, go out that night, but make sure tomorrow morning yeah. <laughs> you don't fucking call off or yeah. you don't give that excuse. Mm-hmm. And I'm a high school coach also, and that's one of the things I try to implement on them. If today you're going to oversleep, if you're not going to uh, go to sleep early today, you know we got training tomorrow at 530, 6 mm-hmm. o'clock, make it. Yeah, right. Make it. I don't care what you, how you're feeling or what. Like, if we're giving this up, we're giving ourselves no sleep, tired, whatever it is. Make it. Don't give yourself that thing where at the end of the year, you're always like, damn, what if? What if I did show up? Mm-hmm. Or what if I did get that extra hour of work? Or what, what if I did show up to that practice? Mm-hmm. I, I hate being on the what if part. Yeah. I'd rather be on, damn, I did it and. That part, that part kills you way more than not getting those two hours of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what you'll be like, for mm-hmm. those two hours, you're like, damn, I need a nap. Mm-hmm. But the what if part, you're like, damn, it's mentally there. And it's like, damn. Yeah. That's, that's just tiring. So to that point, my my – Viewpoint on that is like, yeah, I agree. So if there's a set time where you need to be at and, and there's an opportunity that you cannot miss, and sometimes that's op- that opportunity is just literally getting half a percent better every day. Yeah. That to me, to me is not worth uh, adding sleep over. But at the same time, like you take that individual, myself or anyone else, and you're like, okay, well, sure, you got two hours of sleep that night and you still held yourself to the standard going to training. But, like, in the future, like, where can we, like, adjust to where you can still get your quality rest so that you can maximize that time in whatever opportunity that is, either in training or or whatever the case may be. Like, for example, you know, on the trips that we've taken this year, I can't tell you how many times where we've had an opportunity that kind of carries through, like, late at night and we get back at the hotel 12 or 1 a.m. and then the next opportunity is literally at, like, you know, 5 or 6 in the morning. Like, when I worked out with... Bart Kwan the other day, like he works out hella early and I <laughs> fucking don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's like, it's like, am I really going to miss an opportunity to, to be able to work out with somebody like that? Like, no. So then you have to make that sacrifice. Or I remember when I went to Mark Bell's uh, to, to do his podcast and, you know, I am always sleeping late. So then like my body just carries me through to like 12, one o'clock in the morning. But then uh, one of the jujitsu guys that goes over that I'm friends with that uh, has a, you know, a really good following and, and stuff like that, like gave me the opportunity to train with his team at 4 a.m. Because he's a guy that preaches waking up at like 2 a.m. every morning. I'm like, oh, God, God dude, <laughs> I can't do this. I can but, never. but then it's like. How many times is going to be at Mark Bell? Few and far between. I'm only here for three or four days. So then, like, we kind of have to sacrifice that sleep in order to, like, make the most out of this trip. But, like, in your day-to-day life, you know, to your point, to my point, like, assess your 24 hours and then see what you can do just a little bit better so that you can kind of get close to the best of both worlds from getting enough sleep and then, yes, maximizing that training opportunity the next day. It's like for your high school kids, they could live up to the standard of, making it to practice regardless of how tired or whatnot they are. But then they could also be maximizing the opportunity to train with you more if they did get a few extra hours of sleep the, the day before. And that comes from assessing their day-to-day schedule and, and seeing where they can be better. Thanks. You're not ready. All right. So for, for this part, man, one of the things that I think everybody ad- ad- admires about you is the passion that you bring to the table every single day. In all your videos, all your content, I think everybody that has been around you can vouch for that without even pretending. If you could talk to a younger self, a young Jimmy, what would you tell that person now? Like a high school version of Jimmy or even an elementary version of you into the person you are right now? I think I reflect on some of the instances of self-doubt and understanding that society wants you to fill into a certain status quo. Mm -hmm. And at the time, like especially like high school or even early college, I almost saw what I'm doing now is like almost like this ticking time clock. Like, all right, you're heading towards like that last bit here. You're going to have to like graduate and then get a job and then all these different things. And like I almost 
you know, saw this, this whole thing as, as what I'm doing as a temporary thing or thing that won't be nearly what it is now. Like I better just like work really hard at this now. Cause I'm not going to be able to do this forever. If I were to go back in time and, and tell myself that, and to be honest, I don't necessarily like thinking that way. Cause then it, it, it like almost contradicts my viewpoint of timing's always perfect. Everything happens for a reason. So like if, if I were to go back in time and give myself this advice, I could change the entire course of things that have happened since then. But theoretically, if I could, I just basically say that, why can't you do this for the rest of your life? And almost like leave it at that and then poof away. Like show up for like five seconds. Like, you know, as I'm like working out or, you know, and just <laughs> why can't you do this for the rest of your life? And like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then poof. But then, you know, maybe that kind of gets me thinking. And, you know, to the point of I didn't necessarily like aim to be where I'm at now. It just kind of like one of those things where I kept doing what I do, what is doing as a, as a kid long before social media existed. I just, at a certain point started just documenting my journey and just kept doing that and not necessarily with any intent to go viral or anything like that. And I'm definitely not at the scale that I plan to be even now, but now we're seeing where I'm at. It's like, Oh, just literally like, because I have been so passionate and owned this purpose that I believe that I'm serving things kind of take care of itself. Yeah. And I think there's definitely strategy that you need to implement in order to maintain a certain level of life while you're pursuing that. You know, like if you have big dreams, but you currently can't monetize your passions, then you have to find a little bit of a middle ground so you don't end up under a bridge somewhere. But at the same time, you know, for in, in my case, like I was able to be, be, be put in a coaching role early enough to be able to develop a reputation to develop the clientele to where I don't necessarily have to worry about that. And then the coaching thing is great because I am getting better at training, even through coaching, just being able to learn new things or pushing myself to learn things from my clients. And it's now that I have some momentum going, I'm realizing that it never will and never has to stop. So now giving myself or anyone else advice that's in a similar role, if you find that you have passions, for one, that's one of the biggest blessings or, or one of the most unique things that anybody can have because most people just go through life without that. Yeah. Once you find that, then start to think, how, how can you monetize this? How can you make it, make it professional? Because in America, you can, you can find a way in some way, shape, or form, that's for sure, right? Yeah. And especially with social media and everything else, like there's definitely a way. So then it becomes a matter of, are you willing to think through the proper strategy? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to implement the work ethic possible? But if you really want to continue pursuing your passions now more than ever, it's very much possible. Maybe like way back when, like few yeah. and far between, but like right now at this point where we're at, like it's very possible to to become a, a professional at the things that you truly love to do. Do you think it, it takes a certain type of person though to become professional in what they do? I think I think it takes a certain type of person for sure. And then it becomes that individual's job to determine, like, are you that type of person? Do you have what it takes to become that type of person? And if so, what are you willing to do to make sure that you fall into that role appropriately? A lot of people maybe have a passion or have things that they like, but then understand that there's a certain amount of work and sacrifice and even risk that goes with that. And not being willing to take that work and sacrifice and risk is like a hundred percent. Okay. You yeah. know, and like, that's a hundred percent like to the person's discretion, but for the people that are willing to take the risk that are willing to put in the time for, for that specifically, I'm here to tell you, we're here to tell you that it is possible. You just have to use your, your brain, some initiative, some innovation to be able to make it work out. There you go. Yeah. That's <laughs> literally it. What you said right now is in the weather we live in, if you want to monetize in what you love to do, you can. Mm -hmm. It just takes a certain individual and it takes sacrifice. And it, it, how you said, it takes the way you look at what sacrifice is. Mm -hmm. I've, I've told a lot of people that the only reason we are here is because we're willing to sacrifice what somebody else isn't willing to give up right now, which is time, sleep, relationships, you know, time to go here, time to go there. Why? Because, yo, know, I'd rather do this now and serve my purpose now mm -hmm. than wait five years later for yeah. the right time. Right. I don't feel like there was ever a right time to do this. It was just a time to do it. Like, at that point in my life, when we started this three years ago, was it the moment where I was I got saved by listening to other podcasts, other preachers, other, other people talk and say things. I'm like, man, why? He's saying the exact things that I know what to say, mm -hmm. that I tell other people. 
and they monetize it, and they're touching a lot of people at the same time. So my always thing was, why not me? Mm-hmm. Why not me now? Yeah. I tell her, man, if I wait for the right time, I don't know when that is. I don't know if, if it's the money, if it's the living situation, relationship situation, personal where I'm at. And I could really say, like, throughout this journey, I did get lost in my own thoughts. Like, I fell into one of my most deepest depressions ever. But continuing to do this week after week after week and then being in the right room at the right time and being able to express what I was feeling, it's like, man, that saved me. Mm. I I can tell you countless times where we've been in the gym and, shit, I got to cry. I put on a sad song. I got a lot of emotions in me. I'm just like, damn, bro, like. This is it. And I tell him, I was like, bro, don't be afraid to cry. Why? Because to me, it's like your body and your body is telling you it's time to release. Your body is telling you it's, you have so much shit built up. It's time that you let this shit go now. Whether it's playing a sport, whether it's lifting, lifting in the gym, whether it's working. Hitting your homie. Hitting your homies. <laughs> <laughs> Blessing the bottle. Blessing the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it depends on where. But I feel you got to be in a safe zone. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. You gotta be a, around the right people that I'm not. A, I'm not afraid to cry in front of them. I'm not afraid to be emotional because that's just who I am. Do you? Where is that safe zone for you, where you can you allow yourself to be emotional, whether it's around people or not around people? Yeah, that's a good question. And to your point, I do remember one time on on a New Year's Eve years years ago, I I went into one of the gyms that have like twenty four hour access, and I could like assure that I'd be the only one there, and I used that time as a as a time to reflect and and like cry tears of joy in a sense that I wanted to put myself in a place that symbolizes why I'm in the position now because everybody is out partying and celebrating by just being in the gym. And I just kind of like think about things like that and just cry not out of sadness or anything else, but just like appreciation almost. Mm. When the Goldberg, any Goldberg thing, I remember when he's like, give me your fucking phone. And I was like, yes, sir. And he goes, puts his number in my phone. I'm like, holy shit. I, I have his like contact information. That one got some tears out of me. And it's like, just, it's, um, I, I, I really try to encompass those moments as, as special because it's a it's a literal time to reflect on everything that's led up to that point. I don't necessarily cry a lot. I don't necessarily stray away from crying either. Like when when the time's right, the time's right. But I think times like that, to your point, you know, that bottled up feeling could be a lot of things. It could just be a lot of good hard work and you just let it spill out because working really hard for something and then having some type of feedback like that that's positive, like that needs a certain amount of release too. Yeah. And doesn't always have to be negative. I remember, you know, just whenever going through something hard in life and, and letting things like that bottle up and being around the right person, whether it's my girlfriend or my best friends or my parents at times, letting that, letting that come out. I, I don't know if I have a specific place, but to your point, like, it just kind of like, it, it's whatever, wherever you're at or whoever you're with, I think your body kind of tells you that, that it's okay, that you can kind of put your guard down per se. You know, I've had, I've had talks like that with my, with my coach too, just, whatever reason something bottles up and I just like release and I'm generally seen as a strong, confident, you know, emotionless figure for the most part. But, you know, there's few people that I've let in to kind of be vulnerable in that sense and let it all out. And that's, that's also a huge healthy practice to have because I've also met people that refuse to show emotion that refuse to let any, like anything like that bottle out. And it's like, yeah, in the, mo- in the moment in front of a bunch of people, you may look, like, stone cold, like, tough, but, like, on the back end when you're alone by yourself, that may not be the healthiest practice either. So I think the more you can release emotion in front of more and more people, to me, that shows even greater amount of confidence because it shows, like, you're not afraid to be vulnerable in front of anybody. And past that, you know, when you need to be confident in a much more vocal scale, you can be because you, you trust that, like, your emotions will be, in the right place at the right time, regardless of who or what you're doing in that, in that moment. Yeah, that you allow, especially in social media, right? Because we're, you're in that social media space, we're in that social media space, and sometimes it could become a lot. To be that strong, emotionless person, somebody like that they look up to, it could be a lot. It could be a lot of responsibility where, how you said, a lot of people may not know exactly what we go through behind the scenes, 
but just know that whatever we're handling behind scenes allows us to be here. Mm-hmm. You haven't taken a day off. You've been training. You've been battling through injuries. You've been coaching. You've been moving around. You've been doing everything you're supposed to be doing. And you're here. And everybody gets this version of Jimmy, where I've always said it, me and him, we've always done it. Just because I had a shit day because of this person or this situation doesn't mean you deserve that backlash. Mm -hmm. I am not responsible for what somebody else did to you, Mm -hmm. right? And I take that everywhere, whether it's at a restaurant, whether it's at a store. Maybe this person is lashing out at me because of whatever reason. I'm not to blame. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can, what I always, uh, I love to do, I'm going to kill you with kindness. <laughs> if you're mad, hey, hope you have a good rest of your day. Mm-hmm. You know, some people just need hugs. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'm a hugger, bro. That's what, <laughs> that's how I am. <laughs> I'm a hugger. I'm like, <laughs> just come here, big guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's how you said it, it. It's taken a lot to be, I think, in our position. Mm-hmm. And there was a quote that I listened to, I believe it was like last week. And it was on the Mike Tyson podcast, right? And it, it was something where no one will ever understand the battles you had to go through to be this calm, to be this nice. You know, um, there's a lot of shit, man. Maybe maybe through through childhood till now, through training, through injuries, you may have to go through some stuff that I always said, how I said earlier, could have just put up the boots on top. Could have put up the belt. Maybe, maybe this is not it. Maybe I'm going to stick to coaching, mm-hmm. and you never quit, and you have. And I feel like there's no quit in you. Like you're moving to Texas, so how do you get up and move and continue this journey? Under yeah, so understanding that I've located what my purpose is, mm-hmm. and understanding that it really every single day is just the beginning of that. You know, even if I hit a point to where I I accomplish an end goal or long term goal, then my mindset then creates a new goal that then allows me to pursue that for the next 10 years. If I took like 25 years of my life to get this one goal and I get it, I have the trust that the way that my mentality is, it will create a new one that's going to take another 25 and that's going to keep me up and going every single day. Um, You know, it'd be great to hit a point in life for everybody to just hit a goal, like be rich and never have to worry about anything again. But are you doing your passions to hit a point of, financial freedom and then just stop or are you doing that so that you can live through your passions for the rest of your life and I like to put myself in the category of regardless of how much financial freedom I gain through what I'm doing I'm gonna always look to find a way to be able to do this forever allow my friends to do this with me forever and then be able to take care of myself my family their family and just other other people for, for generations to come. So that comes from that comes from like understanding that the, the goal setting is never never ends regardless of how much you accomplish. Do you put out long term goals or short term goals? I I like to focus honestly more so in the short term, but I understand that the short term accumulates into the long term. So like I have obviously less long term goals because it's easier to specify what short term goals will get me to like my top three long term goals those long-term goals eventually become short-term goals. You know, for example, as a 18, 19, 20-year-old kid, I used to look at guys like a Barbell Brigade, Mark Bell, C.T. Fletcher, and just like, I, I can't, I hope, I hope to be like them one day, like as far as like YouTube or lifting and just have the impact that they do. And now in this past year of my life, I have literally took my first step in the door of becoming that. So that long-term goal five, six years ago became a short-term one where I'm like, oh, we got to plan this trip to Mark Bell next month and like this, this, and that. So that becomes a short-term goal. So then now because those long-term goals are now my short-term goals, then I needed a new set of long-term goals. And that's, okay, now how do we take that next step? How do we take that step into becoming a WWE superstar, becoming a jiu-jitsu prodigy to becoming whatever? And so that's where this new set, and then just, I think that's kind of the process that you go through. And if you accomplish your long-term goals, then then they become short, and then new like long-term goals replace that. And I think that's how you can ever, ever, forever just have that motivation to get up and pursue because you understand, and me especially, I understand that, wow, these things that I thought of as dreams five years ago are now within reach. So now I need to reach even further than that, understanding that I have what it takes to to go through that process, so I just keep building and building and adding to these to these goals per se. Do you think right now where f- the fitness industry lands? Do you think there is 
it went away from when you first started in the gym? Like, yeah. thinking thinking about times, like, <clears throat> if we bring up, obviously, a CT, mm-hmm. those times when everybody started, and that over top of training into where the fitness industry is now. Do you have, like, pros and cons to this right now? I do. My, my main takeaway is that back then, like, if you became something big like CT or Mark Bell or Barquan, it was very well deserved in my opinion like you are a very unique person that has this special persona personality euphoria to yourself that that can bring a group of half a million a million people that want to follow you now it's like the way social media works like anybody can bend over for the camera or flex their chest veins and get to a hundred thousand followers and you you know like i think there's less appreciation for the grind that people like ct or mark bell or the barbell brigade people, the, the grind that they took to get to where they're at. Because back then, getting to that point, like, took a hell of a lot of work, took a lot more innovation, took a lot more creativity and a lot more consistency because gaining a following like they had back then is, is so hard. But now it's like post a stupid reel highlighting some dude staring at your ass and you get, like, $100,000 <laughs> for no reason. It's like that's, yeah. that's silly to me. So with that said, I try to have trust in the, the pudding that they proved to be worthy like ct mark bell like they did this so i'm going to continue to try to do what they did to get to where they're at understanding that i could take a quicker route and and do x y and z and blow up faster per se but but by taking the slower route in my opinion the more strategic route you're going to have me at least i feel like i'm gonna have more of a loyal following more people that truly believe what i do more people that engage with what i do and more people that see me past what i look like or or whatever else so i think yeah, to answer your point, I think it's it's easier to to gain a following on social media now, obviously, but just because you gain a following on social media, it doesn't necessarily mean that that you have what it takes to sustain that. And to me, what it takes to sustain that is personality, a true purpose, a true purpose to help people, like really help people. Yeah. Like, you know, just saying that your stuff's inspiring because you like flex really hard, but not, not really do anything for others. Like what purpose do you serve? Yeah. I think that's like the separation to where – the next generation of CTs, Goldbergs, Mark Bells can can come out and blossom amongst like all the saturation of social media nowadays. Yeah, everybody now is a is a, a gym bro, right? Like, because you <laughs> can I make a can I make a quick joke. It's kind of funny. Go for it, like, go for it. we're we're like behind on technology, like I am and my my friends, and so like we just now invest invest in like this road mic. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, this is sick. Like, great quality. Now everyone has a fucking road mic. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so it's like it like it, like anyone now can just get a road mic and like record themselves in the gym and say like I do lap pull downs for back activation. And like, whoa. And that video blows up. For yeah. No freaking reason. I know. Like, yeah, just silly. So, but. And that's my point of, like, saturation and stuff. It's, yeah. like, it, it, there's no certification for giving advice on the Internet, obviously. So, like, wh- how, do you, how do you separate yourself? And it takes a lot of time, and I'm not perfect at it, nor am I the best at it, but I try to, again, fall in that, that realm of, like, genuine motivation. Somebody like CT just hard-nosed, works his ass off. Somebody like Mark Bell that puts out very educational contact, yeah. you, you know, knees over toes guys, stuff like that. Like, I want to fall into that you, realm. You have a – we have a standard of – who we look up to and why we look up to them. How you said, just because that person has muscles and flexes doesn't mean that they have what it takes to teach the next person or has intentions to teach the next person. I think everybody in here and the people that we surround ourselves are willing and wanting to give the same knowledge that they've learned throughout their journey and pass it on to the next generation because it's not just about us anymore. It's about can we help them coming up that are right now maybe misleaded by how social media is going about? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, don't just post this type of picture. Hey, make sure you work hard. Yeah. Make sure it's not just an on and off switch where you post one video, one picture, let that go viral, and that's all you're doing it for. Mm-hmm. Make sure you're doing it for a reason and a purpose instead of like, all right, I look cool here, but then I'm going to go and do this on this side and value. Yeah, right. Because you, yeah. yeah, because you look good, it doesn't mean you have value into what you're doing. And I've always said it, and this is a good question I want to ask you. If they took all this away, who would you be? Yeah, so to that point, I'd be the same exact person that I am exactly. online. And, and it may be harder to, like, reach out to more people or connect with people because social media is that outlet. But 
I would have to regress and do the same thing that I'm doing right now on social media, but do it in a scale of Arizona and then rebuild in Texas. And it would be yeah. the same thing essentially. Cause again, I think doing it since I was three, four or five years old yeah. and cementing the fact that this is the passion that I enjoy doing between Facts. lifting and helping others. Like that was well before social media. That was well before all this stuff. I can't, it it would almost be disgusting to see the the numbers behind the amount of people that get into like maybe the fitness space because they see people blowing up on social media yeah. and it's like, Oh, I could just look up a YouTube video about how lap pull downs activate your back and just start my own educational page. What <laughs> it's like the passion was never there to begin with. Like yeah. you started it for, in my opinion, the not best reason, let's call it. So I'm blessed because I started so young and I'd be doing it regardless. And social media allows me to advance and expel upon that. But it's, it's, Regardless of social media's existence, it will always be there for me. Yeah, we, I think we talked about it with actually one of the OGs in the gym the other day about oh. what it took to be sponsored, mm, true. what it took to be a sponsored athlete. Before, it was you had to have background. You had to win a show, be a top Olympia, be one of the, the mm-hmm. strongest lifters out here because they did it without social media actually being active. Mm-hmm. Um, and now... These people that are sponsored athletes that are this and that, they've probably never – they're not even pros, never never competed. never competed and don't have aspirations to compete, but they look the par. I mean, they, they look they look good. Yeah. And obviously compared to these power lifters and, like, OG type of people, they're average. Mm-hmm. They're average people at the gym, but because of their following, because of their social media impact, they get these sponsorships. Yeah, yeah. And it's like – they see it as like, damn, you didn't put in the work that I put in mm-hmm. back then to, you know, get that. Mm-hmm. And it just, it goes back to value. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, sheesh. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Because, yeah, I feel I feel for those type of people. And I, I'm not even on the scale of the people that, I don't know, let's call them like the the Dan Greens of powerlifting or the Ronnie Coleman's of bodybuilding. I was about to what say it? that. Yeah, the Ronnie <laughs> Coleman's, yeah, man. Yeah, people like that. And it, and it's, it's puts it in perspective. It's like if, if Arnold – blossomed in the social media era where would he be at mm-hmm. ronnie coleman like those guys like they all came like before that um versus like again like you said some of the guys now like you, you don't have to necessarily have really anything except if you're consistent and you're and you're putting out content yeah. that people deem to be follow follow you a bull if that's a word uh they they kind of gain a following through that and at this point now i i at least respect the people that build a following through truly being educated on the subject that they preach. You know, like, you have a guy like JPG who is not an Olympia bodybuilder at all, but you at least you know that that man knows what he's talking about, and he's, like, very educated in, in what he preaches. You know, even the best uh, football coaches in the world were not the best football players, yeah. you know. So you, you dive down that rabbit hole, but at the same time, yeah, like we talked about, it's, it's very easy to wear tight leggings and do this or, like – get super close to the camera and like flex super hard and like have a video go to 15 million views for really no reason Yeah. when other people are putting out what we deem to be more valuable content. So I don't know if there's ever, there's ever really an end to this topic. It's just, yeah, I agree with yeah. you. It's like, it, it comes down to value. Value comes down to perspective. My perspective is value to just derive from what the person has accomplished or what they're able to educate the masses with. Yeah. And that it's just, it's like everything else. We're one podcast, but there's a thousand and hundreds of other thousand podcasts. Mm-hmm. But what's the difference maker? What what do we give that others don't give? And and it's about picking and choosing, right? There's good things that this person does. There's bad things that that person does. But how do I apply it to myself? Mm-hmm. So you the this whole time you talked about CT, you talked about Goldberg, your dad, and everybody now that has inspired you throughout your journey. You know, being having your own brand also, building your own team. Out of everybody that you've ever been around with, been a part of, who is your Mount Rushmore? <laughs> Say Goldberg, my dad. My three best friend. Well, I, I, I guess, how, how many heads on there? Five? <laughs> There's four, five, four? four heads right now. Can we add? There's four heads. Yeah, yeah we could add. We could add. We can, we can still add some. Yeah, more, we can, we'll yeah. chip them in. We'll chip them out. Yeah, I, I don't know. Between, like, the people that have really had a impact and has really paved the way for where I'm at now, you know, my dad, Goldberg, uh, Coach Scott has allowed me to advance in a lot of different ways at TNT. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at jujitsu wise 
you know, in that regard. Um, my three best friends, like, they literally have d- done everything in their power to sacrifice their lives, their own reputations, what people think about them, to see me succeed. You know, my, my girlfriend sitting right here, there's, there's like, so many people. I don't even know. There's, like, a I, – I can't give you a top four because then I would be discrediting other people that I believe also fall in the mix, to be honest with you. So there's – Tons of people, tons of people. But, you know, as far as the first, like Goldberg and my dad would be like the top two at least because they, they impact me the most from the get-go. And then my yeah. mom, you know, like she her story coming from the Philippines to the to America is also quite inspiring too. You know, there's there's definitely a lot of people, and it's all accumulated to, to where I'm at now. You know, I, I think that's the best answer I can give to you. Yeah, I think we are who we are because of the people that have been a part of our lives with also the addition of – the people that have come and have gone. Mm-hmm. Chris is the one that told us that one time, bro. Yeah. And it was like. Chris is always spinning. Yeah, back. man. That guy. Lose a person, but never lose a lesson. There you mm-hmm. go. So there's always going to be people that come in and out of our lives. And some people are, are only meant to be there for the moment to teach you something about yourself and about the world. Whatever that is. And you just can't hate people. Mm-hmm. I, I, Me and Chris said it the other day. Like, if you lead with love, everything is possible. Bro. Everything just. You know, it becomes okay. Like, whether today was whether today was shit, tomorrow it has no reason to be shit just because today was tough. Mm-hmm. And it's a, the same thing with people. Mm-hmm. Just because that person hurt me doesn't mean I got to pro- prolong that and project that onto the next person that could help me in my life. Mm-hmm. Chris said it. I can know you for six years, but this person that I met for the last six months has done a lot more to me mm-hmm. and for me. Yeah. And I think that that's what our relationships are now is can I give you something of value and can you give me something of value without how you said earlier, without it, without it implementing the platforms, take away the numbers on the platforms. Mm -hmm. What about who am I? I'm going to be this person to you without anything, anything of this Mm -hmm. because outside of the platform is very important. Yes. Right. When you train like you're, your kids probably don't care about, about how many followers on IG. It looks cool. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know how to coach, then they're going to be like, damn, fool. Right. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, and most of them don't even have social media or anything, so they don't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah, they could care less. But but to that point, yeah, it's about being the same person that you are online in person and, and past that even better. I think so CT is actually one of the people that showed me that early on because a lot of people love CT, but also, like, CT in his prime, like, you know, paying himself this really hardcore, like – don't give a fuck, like, you know, like, almost to where some people... Fuck could, excuses. Yeah, some people <laughs> could take it, like, in, in, a, in a negative way. I, yeah. I didn't, but some people could. I always tell people, like, CT, regardless of what you think about him online, I promise you he's an even better person off camera. Yeah. Not that I think his persona on camera is bad, but, like, even more genuine, even more personable. Even I remember when he went to one of my jujitsu tournaments, and... He was standing next to me while I was about to compete, and as we were waiting, he's, like, res- responding to all these different messages that he gets. And I remember somebody asked me, I bet somebody runs his Instagram. And that might be true for certain business inquiries and stuff, but, you know, yeah, no, he's actually replying on his Instagram, and he's trying to get to these people, and he's like, oh, this one guy's talking to me about this problem he has, and I'm trying to help him, and, you know, this stuff. And, like, you know, there's there's people like that where, yeah, they, they truly care, and they truly, truly try to help as much as they can behind closed doors or when the spotlight isn't on him. And I, that was one lesson I think I took away from CT is that regardless of how big I get per se, how much spotlight is on me, I always have to uphold the standard that I need to be essentially even better off camera or yeah. when things aren't spotlighted on me, when it's, when it is truly personable, like just talking to a kid or talking to a parent that could care less. That's when I think you start to really develop a good, true reputation, especially like in your community but something that is a practice that will carry you through when the spotlight is truly on is truly on you with a bigger scale of people that are watching the beauty about this is like we don't pay anybody else to do our content or anything like this Mm -hmm. so it means a lot more to us yeah yeah i think that just it Mm -hmm. relation to yourself too all the work the coaching the lifts the competitions it means so much to you because you've taken control of everything in, in part mm-hmm. of your life. And um, actually, one of the questions that we got from our Q&A that we posted yesterday was for you, and it said, what did you have to lose in order to be here today? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, good. damn, even I was thinking about that one. Like, sheesh. What did I have to lose to get to where I'm at? Yeah. Hmm. That, that's tough because I, I, I know there definitely is an answer to it. It just, I think the way my mind's kind of wired, it's, it's not necessarily viewing things as losses more so a part of the process. So like now I'm having to think like, what have I lost? I mean, I definitely haven't lost time. That's not how I view it. Again, okay. timing's always yeah. perfect. Timing's always perfect. So even if time wasn't maximized in the moment, it's like you can always maximize that time even after the fact through a lesson to be applied or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, and we're, uh, I think I think more, something more maybe physical or emotional in the type of sense, not regarding mm-hmm. how you said mm-hmm. Not, not the regarding time part, because I know how you said timing is everything and it will happen when it needs to happen. Mm-hmm. But th- in order for us to sit here, I know it's it's taken more than what people know. And we just don't know personally what you had to lose. At, at the same time, you don't know personally what we had to lose. Right. So for your viewers, your fans, your supporters, they want to know what what did what did Jimmy had to endure and lose in order to be here for everybody? I'm not sure if this is going to fill in the answer, but <laughs> what I did have to lose was the mentality of caring about what other people think about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I lost because that was one huge hindrance to me yeah. throughout the very beginning of this, the middle, and maybe up until the last like year or so to where – I started to think about, like, okay, now I'm starting to get a picture of what I really want to do, and I want to do X, Y, and Z, okay? So, like, if I want to do X, Y, and Z, I should be able to express that to anybody. So you start small. I express it to my best friends. I know they're not going to judge me regardless. I express it to people, like, outside of my inner circle, and I start to get kind of content with that. But then I start to maybe hit some points to where there's some stagnant progress or maybe a plateau where I'm not progressing as fast as I would like. And to me, you know, understanding, like, my purpose – and, you know, God's here guiding me through that. What haven't I done to shed light on true ownership of that? Well, to me, it was being able to communicate my goals to anybody, any random person. For example, like the average person goes through the route of college and, and goes through their career route and, and to be expressed to somebody that I want to be the next one to impact all these people and do it through lifting and jujitsu. And I want to teach jujitsu for the rest of my life. And I want to be able to teach lifting for the rest of my life. That puts you in a spot to very easily get judged by people that don't believe in that. Right. And so once I started getting comfortable owning that in front of those type of people, I saw some progress happen. And then there's a few select people that are very close to me that I knew wouldn't respond very well to me articulating those goals. However, I remember the instances on specific days where I just bit down on it, ripped the Band-Aid off, took the bullet, and owned everything that I was going to do for the rest of my life in front of a select group of people. And I remember after one of those people, I'm going to be vague just out of respect, but after owning my, my goals in front of a specific person, I remember going up to my friends that same night and I was like, hope you guys are ready for the fucking storm that come in because I literally just got over the biggest fear that I've had for my entire life in regards to owning what I want to do. And I went up upstairs and I told him, I was like, I hope you guys are ready for the storm that's coming because it's going to happen so fast. I guarantee you none of us are going to be ready. And I say things like that and I practice things like that because then my, my idea of manifestation has skyrocketed also to where I understand that the work that I put in the purpose that I have to serve in life yeah. is all guiding me down this path. And, and the more that I speak things into existence, the faster things come about. So I've also realized that my words are some of the most powerful things on earth. Me in particular, I like to have like ownership. Like I have this special power. That's my mindset, almost yeah. like a, a superhero type of power with my words. Yeah. So I, I had ended up like conquering my fear of, of owning what I want to do with my life to a specific person or a specific group of people. And once I got over that dude, like it's, it's, I haven't looked back since, and mm. the opportunities that have come up since then are astronomical, and, and even the people that I knew would doubt me at first, that did doubt me at first, now they see the total picture of what's happening, and now they're supporters, and not that I necessarily needing, needed any one person's support to begin with, but when you can start to turn people that either hate or doubt you, and you turn them into supporters, that's like a feeling of accomplishment in itself, because it's like, 
you believing in yourself so hard that those those feelings become reality and other people are like oh wow like he wasn't kidding or oh wow he's like legit about this yeah i think it, it becomes a one of those scenes where now nah, he's full of shit and nah, he's not gonna do that he's really not he's gonna give up soon mm-hmm. it's not gonna pay off and then you sit in certain areas you're in certain rooms you're in certain places doing certain things and then like oh yeah i always believed in you Bro, you get, right. those, yeah. you get those yeah. people from high school messaging you. Oh, oh yeah, no, that's that's a big one. Here. That's yeah. a big one for sure. Yeah, going back to the first story, like the people that wanted me to do drugs or party or whatever, yeah. are also the ones now like asking me about like what workout they should be doing. And it's even like right now, like you're you're we're such in a pinnacle of our life right now, and a such of a journey where I always say this: we're three years in, you're 23 years in, and for us, I feel like we're just starting. Mm-hmm. Like I tell her, I was like, man, just wait on it. We're mm-hmm. still we're starting. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, dude, but you've accomplished so much. I'm like, what did I accomplish? Certain numbers, certain right. people. What about the rest? Yeah. What about yeah. what's to come? How do we know what's meant to be for us if we're not still working towards it? I don't know what 100 episodes look like, but we will find out soon. Yeah. Right? I don't know what – you You may not know what that jiu-jitsu title may look like until you get there. But if you don't put in that work, go through all the obstacles, then you can talk about it. Mm-hmm. Right? Instead of, yeah, you know, one day, man, you know, back when, when – I could have done this, and then this happened. So that's why I'm not there. Mm-hmm. Fuck that. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about it because I was go. there instead yeah. of instead of being like that what if part again. There goes mm-hmm. what if. There you go. I was about to say that. Yeah, yeah, like the what if part. And one of the questions I do got to re bring up, mm-hmm. right? Um, my bad, guys. I did this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our technicians weren't here today. <laughs> Is coach having kids around in your life? Um, it does something to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm a father of two kids. And I can literally say my son, which is my oldest, three years old, saved my life when I need to save him. And coaching high school kids saved also my life because it gave me a purpose to, like, man, these kids look up to me. These kids depend on me. Their world at home is is burning down. But when we come into this this game scenario, this practice scenario, for the next two, three hours, I'm the safe zone. And I, I always bring it to everybody where – Whatever issue, whatever problem, whatever problem at home relationship you have going on, for the next two or three hours, as soon as you walk in through that door, that shit goes away. Let loose right now. Mm-hmm. You feel whatever you got to feel. I have kids crying on the field. I like all, It's even as this, like, how are you doing today? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not doing well. Let's talk about this now. Mm-hmm. And so that's what kids done for me, right? Dylan, Dylan's an uncle. And I, he looks like those kids, like they're his own also. Mm-hmm. And he, even if, even if we had $5 in our account and he needs something, there they go. I'll be broke unless they have it. You coach kids. They, I feel like they're just such a big part of your life. And I know we're redoing this part. But these kids, do you, do you feel – at one point from coaching them? Because how long have you been coaching this group of kids? I think it's six or seven months, something like that. Okay, yeah. so in these six, seven months, whether at the beginning, the middle, or right now, towards the end of this, that at one point did you feel like they saved your life from a certain a certain event, a certain uh, moment in your life? I th- the, the term save, maybe, maybe that's not the word that comes to mind. The term... Right. I would say maybe the term, maybe multiple terms, but they they formulated even more specifically where I'm going next. Mm -hmm. Meaning I always take whatever happens to me in life and and I analyze it between what happens in the moment, what led before that that caused that to happen, and then why did this happen and what does it mean for the future moving forward. And so this recent chapter of my life, I'm doing a lot of traveling, so – I gave up my adult classes to pursue the traveling, to allocate more time in my personal life, to get ready for my the move and just increase increase myself as, as an athlete or whatever else. But then I was giving those kids, like, shortly before I made that decision. But, like, with the kids coming into my life right then and there, again, why did that happen in the moment? And then what does this mean moving forward? And to me, it meant moving forward that this is, like, my first opportunity to do on a smaller scale, again, what Goldberg did for me, as a child and what he did for millions of kids as a child. What we didn't talk about in the first clip is how I remember being a three-year-old kid and I watched him in WCW and he would 
beat up all the bad guys and then go to the to the rail and he would just pick up some like little girl little boy and like put him on his shoulders and I guarantee you that kid for the rest of their lives that that impacted them in such a way that you know it did for me and I would almost like sit there watch on TV and idolize these kids and then fast forward to when he got me tickets to Smackdown and he couldn't lift me on his shoulders but <laughs> but he did essentially he got me those tickets front row seats and he gave me this big hug that all however many thousands of people got to see and I lived that dream for that split second in time and so okay that was that was a point where I'm like okay that feeling that feeling is something I need to like search and expand upon so then I got those chants with the kids and it's like okay I can be I can be Goldberg for these kids I in this very moment right now I have this group of kids I don't need to search any further than that I can be Goldberg to these kids and to me being Goldberg to these kids are impacting them now in the moment, giving them something to strive for later on in life, and then giving them lessons to pass on to their friends and families for generations to come. So to me, the kids opened up the main purpose of what I'm really here for, which is I always knew I wanted to pack people, but I think like even a step past that, I'm, I'm meant to impact kids. So I need to become the superhero. I need to be the superhero in the moment for these kids. I need to continue chasing my own individual progress to become the best superhero I can be so I can Im impact millions and millions and millions of kids across the international scale. That's, damn, did you see? Damn, that, was, that was better than the first time. That was better it's than the like, first My second time. Let's just re <laughs> re redo the whole goddamn thing, bro. You know what? We're going to start every camera <laughs> yeah, over. Yeah, <laughs> but that, that's, it's, I'm glad we still redid it because even us redoing it and you re-saying this, it's still impactful because, I f there's there's a lot of situations that everybody goes through. We don't know what everybody that comes into our world goes through outside of this, right? So when they come to see us, when they come to see you, it's one of those things where I get this version of them that they've gone through whatever they've gone through. So now they look at that moment at you as, can you help me? Mm -hmm. Without even asking for it. I'm I'm not one of those to really ask for help. Like, I'm going, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to, I'm like, I got to figure this shit out. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you see the emotion, like we talked about uh, the young boy that was crying because he was being bullied because, you know, self-doubt, confidence, and you got him through that. Imagine how many more kids, how many more, even young adults and adults, you impact with the way you teach and the way you move in your life, mm -hmm. in your projects, every stage of your life. You impacted one of your childhood hero. How many more hundreds of thousands have you not impacted that have not told you yet? Right. Right? And the impact that you're leaving right now with these kids, because you, you had said earlier, you are supposed to move on this day, mm -hmm. but because they asked you to stay, and you have every right to not stay, mm -hmm. but you're deciding to. Why is that? Why, why change up plans that you already have for other people like that? Yeah, so again, I think it, it falls into opportunities to fulfill your purpose. So okay. teaching the kids is a huge opportunity. And be prior to this, we were like iffy on when we wanted to move. We like we set mid-March, and that's what we we're kind of running with. But to me, like when this kid asked me at the tournament and he told me his his birthday, April first, I'm like, okay, well, this like this this can be like that last like thing that I that I do where like again I'm I'm sac sacrificing for the kids, and I it, it allows me to formulate a date on moving, and, and it gives me, like, essentially a symbolic last final, like, task to impact this last final child before I, before I move, at least impact him, like, in person. And to me, that was, that was almost like a sign, just basically a sign, like, okay, you know, you could – Again, take this and be like, hey, sorry, buddy, you know, next time or whatever, but... I'll be back. Yeah, and it's, but then it's like, I'll, I'll, like, there's that, and then I, I could leave and, you know, like, I'll do this, and you know how life goes. Like, you, even if you have intentions to, like, it could never come through, and it's like, this is an actual opportunity to do this. Yeah. So while I'm here and able, I want to be able to fulfill that, you know? Like, the other day, when, like, we went to that state tournament for wrestling, I had... Uh, a friend reached out, hey, are you still at the tournament? I have a student that wants to, like, take a picture with you. And I was, like, in my car about to drive away. And I'm, like, I was, like, I'll meet him up front if, if he can come outside. And, like, driving back for, you know, that teenage boy that's wrestling, it's, like, that's, that's an opportunity where as much as that might have meant something to him, it means just as much, if not more, to me because, again, it's, it's an opportunity to fulfill my deeper purpose. I was going to go to the gym, right? 
And I can be like, nah, bro, if I wait and take a picture, then I'm going to get the gym at 9 instead of 8.30. Yeah. But, again, the bigger purpose is I'm going to the gym to even have opportunities like that. So I'll wait a fucking hour for the kid to come outside if, that, if that's what it takes. But, again, it's opportunities like that that I only expect to have more of in the future. So the opportunities that I have to practice what I preach, to practice, like, the actual implementation of impacting people, then I take advantage and I'll drop anything in a given moment to do so, yeah. regardless of what my individual goals are. Can you say, and would you say, you are proud of yourself right now? Yeah, I'm absolutely proud of myself. And I'm more so proud of what I've been able to build and create that that allows opportunities for my best friends to live it with me. I've talked about this on a recent podcast, but what does success really equate to if you don't have others around you to share it with or even just celebrate it with? Mm. You know, because, again, you don't, I guess it's possible to get to places all by yourself, but the way I look at it, there's always somebody or something there helping and guiding you. And the more people like that you have around you, the, the more that you can truly accomplish. And to me, the more satisfy, satisfying it is when you accomplish it because of all the people and pieces it took to get there. Yeah. So, yeah, the, I'm very proud of myself, but more importantly, I'm more proud of the people that have stuck with me to this point of, Dealing with my bullshit, dealing with my attitude, dealing with my physical assaults, <laughs> you know, all, physical these, assaults. all these different things. And, yeah, so it's, 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 a very, it's a very cool thing to reflect back on. And I, I look forward to coming back and being on this podcast when it's, with Joe Rogan status in 10 years and talking about how proud of I am of all of us at that point, to be honest. I think, uh, how you said, how far anybody has came and you got to look at everything you've ever been through. You have to feel proud of yourself for surviving and being in that position. Whether you think you're not in the right mm-hmm. position, whether you think you're not in the best situation, hey, you're still there and you never gave up, right? And we can only get to that point with working. And just because I know we, you got to train, you know, <laughs> then I got to go eat, I got to go eat. I'm training. I'm not going anywhere. I have to train. Nah, we got to. Um, we are, and I've always loved this, we are a quote-based podcast. We live by quotes. I know I've heard endless, and I still hear quotes that I reside with, like, no one understands the monster you had to be in order to be this sane, right? No one, no one understands the journey until it's projected. Or even, like, coming from The Rock or coming from C.T. Fletcher, fuck excuses, never give up, overtrain. There's a lot of shit that we build up and there's things that we res- remember in our darkest moments. So in this part of the podcast, I always love ending with that type of, of question. But do you got one today, Phil? I actually wrote it down. Wow. I wrote a quote down myself. <laughs> wow. Dylan. It's pretty long, but I'll make it I'll make it short. Now say it the way it needs to be said, bro. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm like shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Raise your hand though. Oh, t- can I can I speak? Um, in, the, in the back? <laughs> <laughs> you in the back? Uh, I don't want to, like, for the camera, I don't want to be, like, reading and talking, so I'll try to memorize the last part. Okay. Well, it was, well, like, 3 in the morning, and I'm at the gym, like. <laughs> um, I'll just do... Uh, say I'll the, just do the, the first two lines. Say the way it needs to be said, fool. All right. Um, <laughs> it says, the the quote is says that average is the enemy, and success is your responsibility. So, yeah, that's it. That's a good one. Wait, what? Average is the enemy. <laughs> oh, fuck but, you. Nah, but you got to say it like how like, you mean it, super, though. I, I don't like being in front of the camera. Like, <laughs> um, oh, no, the last the last part? Hold on. Yeah, read, I got to memorize okay, the last part. Wait, just read it the way it's supposed okay, to Okay, so it says, average is the enemy. Success is your responsibility. And change can take place in an instant if you're willing to flip the switch. So. I didn't. Yeah. I like that, Dylan. <laughs> there you go, yes. Dylan. Yeah. Um. I'd, I'd rather just end this with, with you, giving you... I want to hear, yeah. I wanna, oh, no, yeah. You, you got one? You yeah, have I a, do. Yeah, yeah no, I want to hear this. Go for it. <clears throat> Everybody listen. <laughs> <laughs> Words are the most powerful thing in the world when backed up by relentless work ethic. Damn. <laughs> honestly, honestly, the, you cannot mimic these type of moments. These are the... Everybody has always asked us, and now you're a witness to this. This is never scripted. We have ideas. Not we, the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to win a Super Bowl. Cowboys. Next year's our year, dog. <laughs> this is our year. 
<laughs> but it's never scripted. And the most magical, most memorable moments happen the way they're just supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time we, we get to meet you. And from watching you in your journey, bro, I want to say, I don't know how much effect it will have on you, but I want to say I'm proud of you. Thank you so much. Because you have impacted a full group of people. You have impacted the young generation, the older generation, and then people like myself that are in our own craft, but inspire and aspire to be similar to you and the way you move in your life. Thank you. And we wish you nothing but success in Texas. Oh, yeah. you guys. We you. wish mm -hmm. you nothing but growth. We'll go visit Prosperity. you someday. We'll oh, go yeah. visit yeah, you. Yeah, that's the plan to go to Texas, <laughs> man. We want to go to Texas. Hell yeah. Um, but honestly, for everybody watching and listening to you, if there's something you could tell them that maybe they, they need to know about Jimmy or what your fans have done for you. Yeah, the fans, or I don't even like fans. Your supporters, supporters. your family, yeah. your group. My supporters, my friends, my family, those ones close to me, they have always seen that I'm different, and they've allowed me to show why I'm different and not necessarily be afraid to do so. They've allowed me to pursue the goals that I've set for myself, and, and they've allowed the, themselves to, to put the trust in me to know that if you invest in me as your friend, as somebody that you believe in, that it'll all pay off. And whether that's like drawing inspiration from me online or betting your entire future on me, like my friends have, it's the foundation of what keeps me going because I understand that it's not just about what I can do to solidify myself for the rest of my life. It's I have the responsibility of a lot of people on my back, and so that's why I always say... I could put in the work of one person and be just fine, but, like, I'm carrying you guys on my back, and I have to put in the work of four or five different people to make sure that this shit works out. So oh, yeah. to those people, they know who they are. Thank you so much. There you go. That's the podcast, baby. Make sure you stay tuned, you subscribe, and stay tuned for the next one. Yes, sir. Oh.